Welcome to our Approaching the Patient With series. The aim of this part of the site is to think about the way in which we would approach an undifferentiated symptomatic patient or a post-operative patient on the ward and then come to some decisions regarding their clinical care and ongoing management. We're going to look at the topics that cover the main surgical presentations, but we're also going to look at some of the clinical problems faced by junior doctors on the ward on a surgical ward cover shift. So we hope that this series will be useful for senior medical students facing their exams, but also for junior doctors that are about to start their new jobs as surgical house officers. In each presentation, we'll start with the important and relevant background knowledge before covering a more systematic approach to clinical assessment. In this presentation, we're going to talk through the generic systematic approach that we'll use as the model for all in the series that follow. It's worth noting now, though, that clinical assessment can be performed in a variety of different ways. But we hope at Teach Me Surgery that if you follow our proposed method, then you will avoid missing important differential diagnoses and avoid missing important details, and then you'll feel more confident when faced with a new surgical patient on the ward. So let's start. And when you review any patient on the ward, you're going to have to quickly decide on the level of risk that they present to you. It's a quick decision and this is a decision that is hard and it's something that you're going to practice with every patient that you meet. But it's a kind of an end of the bed gran It's a decision that you need to make. What risk level does this patient present? Are they well but potentially quite sick? Or are they really sick and do they require immediate intervention? So to make this decision, you're going to rely on three important information sources. So number one, look at the patient. Are they comfortable and well, or are they writhing around the bed in pain, or are they unconscious? Are they as pale as the bed sheets, or are they as yellow as it gets? Number two, look at the observation chart. Are they in shock with hypertension and tachycardia? Is there a deteriorating trend in the observations, or are they scoring on their early warning score? These physical, physiological scores, like the early warning score, the national early warning score, they're useful triggers, but you need to remember that when you're interpreting them, you need to take into account the whole clinical situation. Number three, speak to the nurse. Because if this is a new patient that you're seeing for the first time, the nurse knows a lot more about that patient than you do right now. So this quick risk assessment is harder than it seems, and it's not something that you're always going to get right. But it's vitally important because it's going to dictate your next steps. It will tell you whether you need to manage this patient as an emergency with an airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure approach, whereby as you assess, you instigate treatment, or whether you've got time to take a more considered approach and take a thorough history for, followed by a competent clinical examination. But whatever your approach to clinical assessment, the purpose is to arrive at a list of possible differential diagnoses which you can then utilize simple bedside tests to rule in or rule out that list and eventually arrive at a single formal diagnosis for your patient. So we're going to cover the ABCDE approach in another session, but today we want to use the rest of this session to introduce a generic systematic approach to approaching the surgical patient. So straight off the bat, we would argue that to complete your assessment in the most efficient way possible, you should have a list of differentials already in mind the moment that you meet the patient. So as soon as you know the presenting complaint, have a list of differentials in your mind. If you know the patient is presenting with abdominal pain, it'd be great to have a list already in mind so that you won't forget to ask the important questions in the history and you won't forget to look for the important clinical signs when you're at the bedside. With every section of this series, we'll give you a model or a sieve that will help you to come up and generate that list of differential diagnoses. Now let's talk about history. Start with an open question. Patients need to be given the opportunity to talk and tell their story, and you'll be surprised by how much information that you're going to get. Not all the information will be useful or relevant to you, but as a professional, now you can quickly act to politely interrupt the patient and redirect them, focusing down on the differentiating points. Now let's think about the questions you're going to ask. Maybe you're preparing for exams and you're worried about the potential for brain freeze when you face that OSCE station. But the truth is it doesn't really matter 
uh, what the patient presents with, you're always going to ask the same um, basic backbone questions. And we give you a system of five. Number one, the onset. You want to ask all the questions about the onset. When did it start? Where did it start? What were you doing when it started? How did it start? Was it sudden? Did it gradually build up? Onset. Number two, progression. What's happened since it started? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? How is it getting worse? How is it getting better? Number three, duration. Have you ever had this before now? And how long has this episode been going on for? Number four, associated symptoms. So they may be presenting with abdominal pain, but you want to nail down their associated symptoms. Is there any vomiting? Is there any urinary disturbance or bowel disturbance? And number five, risk factors. It's important to find out now whether the patient has any risk factors that will predispose them to the diagnosis that you're already thinking about. Of course, as you ask these questions, you should be checking off the potential diagnoses in your mind. For example, if the patient presents with vomiting, you might think of gastroenteritis or bowel obstruction, and the, call, and, uh, and the list goes on. But when you're asking about associated symptoms, Having thought about those diagnoses, you won't forget to ask about the presence or absence of diarrhea or absolute constipation if you're thinking about bowel obstruction. After a full exploration of the history of presenting complaint, you're going to then want to ask about the medical history, surgical history, medications and allergies, and then family and social history. And, these, and the social history should involve questions that will allow you to assess your patient's functional baseline. You need to remember that you need to be flexible with your history taking. If someone presents with epigastric pain, you don't want to leave asking about non use for the medication history or alcohol use for the social history because both non and alcohol are both important risk factors for uh, peptic ulcer disease and it's relevant to your history of presenting complaint. It's worth spending a little bit of time talking now about the social history it's really important, no matter what the presenting complaint, to ask questions here. It gives you a better chance to know your patient. For example, ask your patient, what do they do for a living? Are they working at the moment? If they're not working, maybe they're taking time off sick because of this problem they present to you with. You then need to ask about their activities of daily living. This is more important with the older patients that you see, but never assume anything, and then you won't miss an important detail. This is how you're going to assess their functional mobility and functional baseline. And it's going to be really useful when it comes to rationalizing surgical intervention at a later date. So you need to think about your own morning routine and apply it to your patient. Ask them, do you need help getting up in the morning, washing, dressing? Do you need help going down the stairs? Do you need help cooking or preparing breakfast? Who does the cooking at home for you? Who does the shopping at home for you? Getting all of that information down now as the clerking doctor can save so much time for your colleagues later on. If you're thinking about infection, you can ask about recent travel in the social history, but you can also ask about any sick contacts in the family. And of course, you need to ask about smoking and alcohol consumption. Let's move on now to the examination. And William Osler famously said, listen to your patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. So having taken your history, You've got a good idea of what's going on now, so you can approach your examination in a focused way. Again, we want to think about five as our model for approaching the examination. Number one, consent. Number two, inspection. What can you see from the end of the bed? Number three, palpation. Number four, percussion. And number five, auscultation. If you need to recap the important details of any of the physical examinations for the surgical patient, you can do that elsewhere on our site. Next, we want to think about investigations. And again, let's use a rule of five to guide what we do here. Number one, bedside tests. Number two, blood tests. Number three, microbiology. What are you going to culture? Number four, imaging. And number five, specialist tests. If you think through this system of five for every patient that you clerk, you won't miss organising something important early on. For example, getting the cultures done before initiating antibiotics. 
and you won't avoid any delays. If you see a patient that you think needs a scan, you can organize this now, knowing full well that it might take some time. And lastly, we get to management plan. So you've seen the patient, you've taken a competent history, you've taken a thorough physical examination, you've ordered some simple tests. But it's really easy now, especially if you're a new doctor, for your mind to go blank when you're thinking about a management plan. Again, let's think about a system of five and make things simple. Number one, does your patient need oxygen? If they do, put it on and titrate it to SATs. Number two, IV fluids and fluid balance. So do they need IV fluids? Do they need a fluid balance chart? And also think, do they need a urinary catheter, whether it be for urine output monitoring or, or curative in urinary retention? And number three, drugs. Number three is for drugs, because there are three drugs that you need to think about for every patient that you see. Number one, analgesia. Make sure they're comfortable. Number two, an antiemetic. And number three, um, antibiotics. The three A's. Number four, VTE prophylaxis. So for every patient that we see that's coming into the hospital, we need to decide what their risk of venous thromboembolism is. And we need to start TED stockings if there's no contraindications and think about starting low molecular weight heparin injections. And number five is escalation. And I mean escalation in two different ways. Number one, who are you going to call now that you've seen this patient? Who do you need to help you? But also, number two, thinking about where this patient would be best managed. Are they okay on, the, on a basic surgical ward? Or do they need higher dependency um, areas or critical care? And there we have it. That is the end of this presentation. We weren't planning on surprising you here with anything, but we just wanted to give you some simple tips to avoid feeling lost when faced with a new patient problem or a clinical situation. We also think that we, you'll agree with us that if you follow the systematic approach in the system of fives, you'll work in a more efficient way, which will help you with the acute take or with an upcoming clinical examination. And in the next session, we'll offer up a whistle-stop tour to the ABCDE assessment. See you there.